Now it's time for us to go ahead and revisit a concept that most of us have visited before in various certification classes, and that is IPv4, <clears throat> specifically issues that address IPv4 addressing. Now we want to really focus on addressing in IPv4 in this particular section. Addressing for v4, and then we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at v6. And by the way, not only are we going to be looking at v4 and v6 addressing, but we'll also take a look at services. And for IPv6, we will go ahead and talk about the v6 routing protocols and transition mechanisms. Later on in Module 4, we'll be looking at V4 routing protocols as well. We can learn so much about the operation of a protocol by examining the particular protocol's header. When we look at the IPv4 header, for example, we see that uh, there's the type of service field. The type of service field is going to allow us to mark traffic at layer three. We've been talking a lot about marking in this class. We know this is for quality of service. So sure enough, we have this type of service field which allows the marking of traffic. Now, the IPv4 header problematically can be of variable length. So notice we have to indicate the length of the header. If we contrast this to the IPv6 header, which I'm also showing on screen here, we can see that uh, the header is going to be of a fixed size. As a matter of fact, one thing you notice when comparing the two headers is that the IPv6 header is a lot simpler. Yeah, it is a lot simpler. And this is part of the wonderful efficiencies they've designed into the header. Now, wait a minute, you might say, uh, how can the header be of a fixed length? What about with V4, how there's different options we can have set in there? How do they pull that off in the V6 header? Well, the key to the fixed size V6 header is this next header field. This is the wonderfully thought out field that allows you to reference additional headers for additional information. But the V6 header itself is going to be of a nice fixed size. Something else, if you look in the V4 header, you'll see like the time to live. We know this is a loop prevention mechanism. We see the protocol field. This is to indicate whether the IP packet is like the OSPF protocol or the EIGRP protocol. There are flags in the IPv4 header that will allow certain things like, don't fragment me. <laughs> we can say, don't fragment me. We know there's the fragment offset, and we'll talk about IPv4 fragmentation a little later on. So we learn so much about the protocol by examining the protocol's header. Now, one of the things I really want you to know about is this type of service field and the options that we have in the type of service field for marking your traffic for quality of service purposes. We remember that the first three high order bits, so the first three bits from the left moving to the right, the first three bits of that type of service byte can be used to mark what is called IP precedence. This gives us marking values in binary of these combinations, and this translates in decimal to this first column I have here called marking. So if we are marked 0, 1, 0, this gives us a marking of 2, and this goes by the name immediate. And this is a lower priority than if we were to mark the traffic as 5, with a 101, this is called critical. You know what traffic we mark with an IP precedence of 5? Yeah, sure enough, it's our voice over IP packet. 
we are marking the VoIP with as high a marking as we possibly can. And you might ask me, well, wait a minute, Anthony. Why not mark the VoIP with a 6 or a 7 designation? And the answer is Cisco begs us to never use IP precedence markings. Why don't they want us to use these IP precedence markings? Well, because these markings are used by the routers and switches themselves for their control traffic. Notice they're appropriately named Internetwork Control and Network Control. So Cisco says, don't use those markings, so we go ahead and mark VoIP with an IP precedence as high as we can. By the way, the IP precedence approach, it's now considered legacy. This is the older legacy way to mark, where we just use the first high order three bits in the type of service byte. The new and improved way to mark is to use what's called the differentiated services code point. Ah, oh, yeah, we remember talking about the differentiated services approach to quality of service. So sure enough, this differentiated services code point approach to marking, this is based on this new and improved overall approach to quality of service that we can take. Notice that instead of using just the first three high order bits like we do in IP precedence, the DSCP approach utilizes the high order six bits. Yeah, the high order six bits are used for this differentiated services code point. It is kept completely backwards compatible with IP precedence. So DSCP will be backwards compatible with IP precedence, but notice we love the fact that it does give us these three additional bits for marking. Right off the bat, if you do the math, you realize there were eight total possible markings with IP precedence, and we're going to have a whopping 64 thanks to the differentiated services code point approach. By the way, differentiated services code point also said, you know what? Let's totally use all of the eight bits. And we'll use bits 7 and 8, not for the DSCP markings, but for something called explicit congestion notification. So finally, there is meaning to all 8 bits in the toss byte. That's a great thing, because we know how valuable it is to go ahead and have these marking capabilities. Why? waste bit settings that could be used to communicate valuable information for something like quality of service. Okay, so great, great stuff here. This differentiated services code point approach to marking. And like I said, have no fear. It is totally backwards compatible with the IP precedence approach. And you're probably wondering, well, Anthony, how in the world could that be? How can it be backwards compatible with the IP precedence? Well, again, it all hinges on the first three bit settings. Let me show you an example. This is a little more detailed than we need to get in for CCDA. But hey, I want you over prepared as a CCDA individual. I'm certainly not going to try and cut corners and under prepare you. So we said that there was the marking that we had in DS, uh, in IP precedence, excuse me, and that marking was IP precedence 5 that we would give voice, and the first three bits would be set to 101. Well, guess what? In the DSCP marking approach, we are asked to mark voice with the expedited forwarding marking called EF. And what are the first three bits set to? You guessed it, 101. As a matter of fact, for perfect backwards compatibility with IP precedence, the engineers invented what's called the class selector DSCP markings. The class selector marking to be perfectly compatible with voice traffic is uh, IP precedence, excuse me, is one. Zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Look at that. It gives you the perfect 
compatibility with IP precedents by setting those last three bits there in the six bits to zero, zero, zero. So we find out that the new and improved differentiated services code point way to mark is indeed backwards compatible with IP precedents. By far the most well-known, the most famous DSCP toss byte marking is the expedited forwarding per hop behavior. It has a decimal value of 46, and the six bits are set to 101110. This EF marking is indeed for voice traffic. And when routers see this, they're going to make sure that they prioritize it. For instance, think low latency queuing. They'll prioritize this voice traffic, and as far as congestion avoidance goes, they will never, ever drop this traffic as part of their weighted random early detection. Uh, I guess theoretically they might, uh, but it would have to be like an extreme, extreme case of congestion. They're going to do everything they can to not drop this particular traffic. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at some other markings that are there as part of the differentiated services code point. We have a bunch of classes that are called assured forwarding classes. And with the assured forwarding classes, we have the initial two bits set to, uh, the initial three bits, excuse me, set to like 100, zero, zero, for instance. And this would give us our assured forwarding class of overall four. And notice this kind of coordinates to IP precedence four, doesn't it? The one zero zero in the first three bits is like IP precedence four, and this is the assured forwarding class four. What they then do is they take the next two bit settings. Notice it's a, A, A to indicate the assured forwarding class, then it's D, D. These two bits here are used for drop probabilities. Pretty cool. So you can indicate low drop, medium drop, or high drop probability for a particular traffic form. Pretty darn cool. So lots of great marking capabilities with the differentiated services code point approach to marking. And as we can see, it's much more sophisticated than the earlier 3-bit IP precedence approach to marking traffic. By the way, we saw that there was the field in the IPv4 header called fragment offset. And there was also the header checksum field. This is because yeah, fragmentation is a fact of life in an IPv4 world. And how fragmentation works in this world is that there is a maximum transmission unit, of course, for particular media. For Ethernet, the one of the main technologies we cover in this course, the maximum transmission unit is 1,518 uh, bytes, 1,518 bytes. So you can have any device detect this maximum transmission unit, and any device in the path can be the device that fragments or even further fragments a packet so that it can be successfully sent on the media given the media's maximum transmission unit. Fragments are going to be reassembled at the destination host. So imagine a workstation, and it's like, oh, wow, I'm getting a lot of data today, and oh, the data's all chopped up into pieces. There's all this fragmentation in the data. So the receiving host has to sit there and reassemble the data, make sure that none was lost, none was damaged. If fragments were lost or damaged, notice the entire packet has to be retransmitted from the sending system. Notice that you can control fragmentation in the flags field that we saw in the IPv4 header, as there is the option to do not fragment. 
that can be set in the flags field, but understand this could risk packet loss if the device sees that it cannot send the packet due to a maximum transmission unit situation. Now, in our CCNA experience, in our CCNA experience, we learn to subnet networks, don't we? We learn to subnet our TCP IP networks. And TCP IP subnetting is so, so very important. Imagine a world without subnets, right? If we couldn't subnet our TCP IP infrastructure, well, then all devices would end up sharing the same bandwidth. And they would be sharing the same broadcast domain. And how about security? Oh, my goodness. So, you know, if we were handed or if we decided to use 10 dot zero dot zero dot zero slash eight private address space if if we couldn't subnet if that was the the addressing that we were going to use well sure we could accommodate all of these many many host machines but they'd all have to be in the same subnet with each other this is absolutely ludicrous so we know a big part of TCP IP version 4 addressing is dealing with subnetting, is taking an address and extending the subnet mask in order to create smaller networks called subnets as a way to reduce traffic overall, reduce the propagation of a broadcast, how far the broadcast needs to go, how many machines it needs to be delivered to, and to go ahead and overall add to the security of the network by doing more security mechanisms as we go from subnet to subnet. Remember, an IPv4 address is really that 32-bit address consisting of those four octets where each octet as its name implies, contains eight bits. So that's really what the IPv4 address is. And we remember that these addresses are organized into address classes. We've got the class A space, where the first bit is always going to be a zero, and the first octet in decimal will range from one to 126. We've got the class B space where the first two bits will be forced to 10 and we get a value of 128 to 191 in the first octet. And then we've got our class C where it is going to be decimal 192 to 223 in the first octet as a result of the bits being set to 110. So these are our primary IPv4 address classes that are used for addressing our systems. And we notice a curious thing when we look at this. We notice that the 127 address is not mentioned here. It's not used. It's like we skipped it. And we know that 127 is a special reserved address. And that is reserved for the purposes of loopback testing. That's right. This is a special address that is used. Oh, a, a common use of this address is for you to go ahead and uh, examine the health of your own TCP IP stack. What do I mean by this? I mean to be able to ping yourself. It's great, a great way to test that IPv4 is set up properly on your system. You can go ahead and ping this loopback address. You should try it sometime. Go to your Windows workstation even and ping 127.0.0.1, for example, and your own device should respond to itself. So loopbacks have a lot of great purposes. One of the purposes we often use them for is testing, okay? is a way to test our system. Good stuff.
All right, something else that's curious about these address classes is do they end at the do they end at the class C? No, no, they don't. And you're responsible for knowing this as part of your CCDA training. No, they don't end at these class C addresses. There is the class D address space. Okay, so there is a class D. What is class D for? Let me ask the audience, what is class D for? Oh, yeah, great job. Class D is for multicast applications. Yeah, class D is for your multicast. As you can see, class D starts at 224 in decimal. So class D is your multicast addresses. A great example of a multicast address would be 224.0.0.9 used by routing information protocol, specifically RIP version 2. And then is there a last class? Is there a class E class? Yep, there sure is. There sure is a class E. And these were some uh, addresses that they reserved for experimental purposes. So it worked out perfect that it was an E designation because these were set aside for experimental purposes. Now we know that there are addresses from the, oh, wait a minute, before we go further, I want to review with you uh, subnet masking. Sure, sure, sure. The subnet mask, as we know, is a critical component. That's why it is a required component when we configure TCP IP addressing. What does the subnet mask do? Well, it indicates exactly how much of the IP addresses in the network, uh, it indicates exactly how much of the IP address identifies the network. The analogy for this is how much of the IP address identifies your street. If you want to think of a postal mail analogy, how much of the IP address identifies the street we live on, and then how much of the IP address identifies our house number. This is called the host portion of the network uh, address, and this is called, the highlighted blue portion would be the network portion. So we live on, in this example, the 1020.1 network, and our house number is 101. So these version 4 IP addresses, they have a network portion, and then they have a host portion, and the subnet mask is that key ingredient that allows us to distinguish between the network and host portions side of the address. It's well named because the subnet mask, it masks off the network portion. I don't know if that's where the name came from, but that's how I always remember it. A lot of students ask me, why is it called a subnet mask? What a weird name. Well, it masks off the network portion of the address. We know that for a class A, the default mask is 255000. So eight bits of the class A address, eight bits are used for the network identification by default. In a class B address, 2552500 is our mask. We know that by default, 16 bits are used for the identification of networks. And in class C networks, by default, it's a mask of 2552552550 for the identification of networks. We can see that it is 24 bits that are used for the identification of a network in the class C world. Awesome. Now, a formula that we need to know 
as design associates is the formula of subnetting. In other words, when we subnet, when we take the subnet mask and extend it to the right, when we add bits to the subnet mask by extending it to the right, when we do this, we are allowing for the creation of additional networks. Okay? When we move that subnet mask to the right, when we extend it to the right, we are creating room for additional subnetworks. Now, one of the things that we are responsible for is being able to calculate, right? being able to calculate just how many subnetworks we can create. And for that matter, we are responsible for being able to tell just how many hosts we can support. You see, TCPIP subnetting is a give and take game. When you extend the subnet mask to the right and you have the ability to create your different subnetworks, this comes at the cost of those subnetworks being able to support fewer and fewer hosts. So the formula, as you probably already know, but this will be a good review, the formula for the number of subnets that you create when you extend the mask, the formula is 2 raised to the n power for the number of subnets that you can create. What is the n? This is where n equals the number of subnet bits. OK, so let's try this. So if we had, uh, let's say we had, we wanted to go ahead and, and create a subnet out of the 10, 0, 0, slash 8 address space, right? If we wanted to go ahead and do this, if we go ahead and take 8 bits, we extend the subnet mask by 8 bits, we have just done 8 subnet bits, right? Yeah, we have just implemented eight subnet bits. OK. So two raised to the eighth power will be how many subnets that we can create under this scheme. Obviously, you can see where this is real important for us to know as potential designers of the organization's TCPIP addressing plan. Now, it works out uh, that 2 raised to the 8 is 256. So we can create 256 subnets. How did I know that 2 raised to the 8 is 256? Well, we have memorized these important powers of 2, don't we? I can actually do a quick power of 2 chart thanks to all of the subnetting we end up doing. 2 raised to the 0 is 1. 2 raised to the 1 is 2. 2 raised to the 2 is 4. 2 raised to the 3 is 8. 2 raised to the 4 is 16. Notice we're just doubling the value. 2 raised to the 5th is 32, 2 raised to the 6th is 64, 2 raised to the 7th is 128, and then 2 raised to the 8th is 256. Yep. Pretty cool. 
what's the formula for the number of hosts that we can support? We know 2 raised to the n, where n is the number of bits that we have borrowed or stolen for subnetting, we know that allows us to calculate the number of subnets. But what's the formula for calculating the number of hosts? Well, that formula is 2 raised to the n minus 2. That's for the number of hosts that we can support. So back to our example, if we're going to create subnets under this scheme, we're using 16 bits for the network identification. That leaves 16 bits for host identification. 2, oh, by the way, did I do that last calculation wrong? Um, I did, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I, uh, ugh, 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 ugh. let's start again. Rewind, holy Oh, no, no, I did, I did that last calculation right. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm getting myself confused. Uh, yeah. We borrowed eight bits from this field, right, for subnetting. So that allows for the creation of 256 subnets. That's right. Right, that's right. Okay, perfect. I, I just all of a sudden thought I had done something wrong, but no, 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 no. Okay, so how about this example now? We've taken eight bits for the subnetting, right? That leaves 16 bits for hosts. Okay, there's 16 total bits that are going to be used for the creation of the network portion. That leaves 16 bits for the host identification. Uh-oh, now we need a calculator. Because this is the number of hosts that we can support on a subnet. And uh-oh, now we need a calculator. Okay? So you can just pull up a calculator. I will in the background here. I'm going to just pull up a calculator and we say 2 raised to the 16 is equal to 65,536 minus 2. We can have 65,534 posts on one of these subnets. Wow. This is why we don't often subnet like this. That, that's, a, that's a waste, isn't it? We can't have anywhere close to that number of hosts on a network segment. We'd have huge problems with everybody sharing that bandwidth and everybody broadcasting. That's why in the CCDA examples that you typically see, you're going to find a lot more, you know, you're going to find a longer subnetting scheme. You might see, for example, 10.x.y.0 slash 24. If we're using 24 bits to go ahead and identify the network portion, this leaves 8 bits for the host identification. And this is much easier for us to calculate, and it's a much better number that makes sense, right? It would be 254 hosts are permitted per subnet. So notice when we are addressing our internal hosts with the 10.x range, we typically use a slash 24 mask because that gives us a nice common sense number of hosts per subnet that we can support.
I keep giving you examples that are utilizing the 10.x TCP IP address space. Why are we doing that? Well, because this is part of the private use only addressing we so commonly use inside our corporations. We know there is the distinction between public addresses that are globally routable on the public internet and private addresses that are not publicly available, that can't be globally routed. This all came about when the IPv4 address exhaustion really started becoming apparent in the 1980s. Private IP address spaces were a way to apply a Band-Aid to this situation. We could reuse these private addresses all we wanted in local area network environments and just use network address translation to translate these private use only addresses for communications on the public internet. Has a CCDA, you should definitely have these addresses memorized. We know the class A space is the 10.x space. There are a series of class B networks reserved from 172.16.0 to 172.31. There's a bunch of class B networks they reserved, and then they reserve the entire class C space that begins 192.168. So if you see an address, and that address is like uh, 172, that address is 172.16.3.254. You immediately recognize that address as one of the private use only addresses. Or if you were to see an address and it begins 10. anything, we immediately identify it as one of the private use only addresses. Obviously, a very, very important skill to have. Well, let's try a practice exam question to wrap up this section of the course. Examine the address and mask shown below. How many hosts are addressable in that subnet? <clears throat> so how many hosts can we have in this particular subnet? Notice the address is 192.168.1.110. The mask is 255.255.255.240. How many hosts are addressable in this subnet? Okay. Well, here's how we'd solve this. Okay, so we've got, we go to scratch paper to solve it. Some people can solve stuff like this in their head. I am not one of those people. <laughs> I always use scratch paper for something like this to make sure I don't make some foolish error. Okay, so there's the address, and then here's the subnet mask. Uh, it's actually 255 and then 240. Okay, so what we have to figure out to figure out how many hosts are permitted in this addressing scheme is we've got to figure out how many bits are used for identification of the network. Well, 255 means 8 bits there, plus 255 that means 8 bits there, plus 255 means 8 bits there, plus 240, that's the first thing that we have to solve for. How many bits does 240 represent in that fourth octet? Well, let's see. Uh, 128 is in the, would be the value of the highest order bit, plus 64, 
that gives us 192. So this would be if we used two bits of subnetting, we'd have 192 in that field. If we add a third bit, it's 224. If we add a fourth bit, aha, it's 240. So four bits is going to give us the 240. So it's 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 4. What does this add up to? 8 plus 8 is 16, plus 8 is 24, plus 4 is 28. There are 28 bits in this scheme for the identification of the network. There are 32 bits total minus 28. That gives us four bits for host identification. All righty. We plug this into our magic formula. 2 raised to the fourth power minus 2. The answer, 14. We can support 14 hosts per subnet given this IP address and mask. We love questions like this in the certification environment because they're math. It's wonderful. It's black or white. Or in this case, it's zero or one. <laughs> it's clear cut. There can be no error in interpretation here. This is simply a mathematics exercise. By the way, remember, great point to remind you at this point in the course, if you're struggling with any of the concepts that we cover in CCDA whatsoever, what do you do? Well, you just run up to the IEOC.com, IEOC.com, and you post your questions in the CCDA forum. Yep, the instructors and your peers are looking to help you up there in the IEOC.com. Well, next up, we'll be taking a look at more services and issues that we need to cover involving our friends, those IPv4 protocol and addresses.